Good morning. I could not make it to church today because I am <clears throat> homesick, but I wanted to make sure that I uploaded my Acts chapter 16. So here we go. <clears throat> Last time we covered Acts chapter 15, and the legalists in the new church were trying to impose laws such as the new believers must be circumcised in order to be saved. And they were told that this was not true. We are under the mercy of Jesus, saved only by the grace of God. We are not under the old laws, which were impossible to keep, even for the strictest Pharisees. Paul and Barnabas had an argument over whether Mark should go with them on their mission. They agreed to disagree and went their separate ways. Paul took Silas and Barnabas took Mark. So they were able to cover, cover twice the territory to spread the gospel. And here we are at Acts chapter 16, verse 1. <clears throat> then he came to Derbe in Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go with them, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Now, this might confuse you as to why Paul would have Timothy circumcised after making such a big deal of not needing to be circumcised to be saved. Well, Timothy was half Jewish, and if he were to go out with the apostles and share the gospel, and they knew that he was Jewish but not circumcised, that would discredit much whatever he had to say. So Timothy getting circumcised would help remove any stumbling block he might have had with trying to bring the word to the other Jews. Verse 4. <clears throat> and as they went through the cities, they delivered to them to the de they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. They shared the new covenant that Jesus made with them. They, that said that they didn't have to sacrifice animals anymore or follow the hundreds of old laws of Moses. They were simply to love and serve each other, not worship idols, stay away from sexual immorality, not eat animals that were strangled or the blood of animals. Verse six. Now, when they had gone through Phygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they did come to My Mycia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So these guys were obedient to God, and they sought after his leading in everything that they did. They prayed for his direction, and guess what? They received his direction. Have you ever come to a crossroads in your life and wish that God would tell you what to do? He will. He wants us to seek after him for his guiding in all aspects of our lives. But you really have to be in a prayerful state, quiet, and you need to ask and you need to listen. You may need to pray about it with others. Come to God of one accord as the apostles did, and you will get an answer. I think most of us fail to do this, but we were told not to lean on our own understanding in Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 7. <clears throat> Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your, in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. <clears throat> okay, back to Acts, verse 8. So passing by Mycenae, they came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Another great point. When you ask for God's leading, it is wise to follow his instruction. Too often we ask for his leading and we don't really like the answer or we don't really feel ready to follow that instruction. 
how much simpler and better our lives would be if we weren't so stubborn. It's really like we pray <clears throat> to hear the answer that we want, or we get impatient and we move forward like Abraham and Sarah did. God told them he'd bless them with a child, but when it didn't happen as soon as they thought it would, they took matters into their own hands. And Sarah had him sleep with her maidservant and have a baby. And that baby, Ishmael, was a wild ass of a man who became the father of the Arabs who have warred with God's chosen people to this day. Even though they did this, God, being a merciful and loving God, and a God of his word, still blessed them with their own child, Isaac. Verse 11. <clears throat> Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. <clears throat> Typically, the apostles would go to the Jewish temple of whatever city they went to reach out to. They wanted to get to God's chosen people first, to those who had a good base of love for God already. This city had no temple. You had to have at least 10 Jewish men in the area to have a temple. If you didn't, the Jewish women would worship God by the river. So that's where the apostles went to share the gospels with the women. And some of the men that showed up there. Verse 14. <clears throat> now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyracia, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now, Lydia was wealthy. She had her own business. She sold items that were dyed with purple, which was rare and expensive. She had her own house and her own servants. But had she been a man, inviting the apostles to stay would have been a no-brainer. But as a single woman, inviting them to stay would look wrong. Yet she begged them to stay and did persuade them to do so. So she must have been a pretty good saleswoman also. Verse 16, <clears throat> now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servant of the God most high who proclaimed to us the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. So this young lady was demon possessed. And through that torment, was able to do fortune telling and bring a lot of money to her masters. The demon inside of her could not help but cry out that the apostles were of the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, you might think that having someone follow you everywhere you went and announcing that you were a servant of the God who is most high, who proclaims the way to salvation, you'd think that would be a good thing. But look at who or what it's coming from. It actually discredited the apostles to have a demon-possessed girl sing their praises. It would be like <clears throat> an evil person, someone who abuses children and violates women, telling the whole town what a great person you are. You wouldn't want them even mentioning your name because you would become associated with them. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. So this poor child who was tormented by the demon for the profit of her masters was finally delivered. <clears throat> and I would assume came to be saved and a follower of Jesus after this deliverance. The wicked men who made money off of her were enraged. Their cash horse was no longer possessed, and they she could no longer tell fortunes. 
verse 20. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore up their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Remember, there wasn't much of a Jewish presence in this city. It was full of heathens who lived for pleasure. They didn't want these pious men coming in and spoiling all their fun. They beat them bloody and they put them into the darkest recesses of the prison in shackles so they couldn't escape. Verse 25. <clears throat> but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. You've got to love this. These guys were beaten, bloody. They were sore. They were uncomfortably handcuffed, sitting on a damp, cold floor. Most of us would have been having a pity party, crying out to God for his deliverance. But not these guys. They were praying and they were singing hymns to God. Paul seems to refer to this incident when he wrote Colossians 4, verse 2 through 4. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it to manifest as I ought to speak. So when we're going through tribulations, we must still pray and give thanks to God because he is always blessing us and he's always fortifying us. And it's important that we do this not only for ourselves, but that others can see what a wonderful God we serve. And they can see that we can suffer and we can still sing his praises, knowing that Romans 8, 28, and we, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. So you have Paul and Silas singing praises to God, singing of his glory. And that had to get the other prisoners' attention and their curiosity up. My guess is that they had a revival in that prison and they saved a whole lot of souls that day. Verse 26. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. God heard them and he answered in such a powerful way. And you know that souls were saved at that very point, seeing the power of the one living God in action. Verse 27. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing that the prison doors were open, supposing that the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. The guard knew that he would be killed if the prisoners had escaped. Verse 28. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. So then he called for a light, ran in <clears throat> and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out saying, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I love it. This guard saw them praying and singing to God, saw the doors open and the chains loosed, and he knew that a miracle had happened. This was the act of a living God, not of dead idols that were rampantly worshipped in the city. He wanted to have what Paul and Silas had, that joy, that real relationship with a living, loving, merciful God who hears your prayers. Verse 31. And they said, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. The simple gospel truth, the truth that saves souls. We don't have to do a bunch of work to get to heaven. We simply need to believe that Jesus came. He died on the cross for our sins. And he returned to be in heaven at the right hand with his father. It is by faith we are saved, and praise God for that. Verse 32. 
Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when he brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. And that's a beautiful picture. The man who probably whipped them bloody and imprisoned them saw the light. His whole family saw the light. All were saved and baptized. The guard washed them. He fed them, and he rejoiced with them. And it must have been a beautiful celebration. Verse 35. And when it was day, the magistrates sent the officers saying, let these men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, these magistrates have sent to let you go. Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans and have thrown us into prison. And now they get to put us out secretly. No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. So Paul, being a Roman citizen, had rights that were violated. He could have probably avoided the whole getting beaten and thrown into prison, avoided the whole suffering, but he did not. I believe that he was led by the Holy Spirit to take that beating, to go into that prison in order <clears throat> that God could do a miracle and that many others, prisoners and the guard and his family would be saved. They suffer persecution to save others. They sacrificed. We need to take note. How can we sacrifice to save, to save others? In a lot of cases, it's sacrificing our time, praying for others, serving others in need, sharing the gospel, despite being ridiculed by the masses. This is all a lot less of a sacrifice than being beaten and thrown into a prison. I think we can commit to some of these sacrifices on our time. Verse 38. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So even though they were asked to leave the city, they went straight to Lydia's and prayed with them and worshiped with them and encouraged them. And then they left only after following the direction of the Holy Spirit. And that is Acts chapter 16. You have a blessed Sunday, my friends.